Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to CSIS, to the Americas program here. My name is Carl Meacham, and I'm so happy that you are all able to join us today for our discussion uh, of the latest trends in global internet governance uh, and the role of Brazil, or the role that Brazil is playing on the issue. Uh, our event today is part of the CSIS Americas Brazil initiative that we launched last month. Uh, this initiative addresses a series of specific issue areas in which bilateral cooperation and private sector collaboration uh, can advance understanding between the United States and Brazil. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to thank our panelists uh, for speaking with us today. I'm thrilled to have Beatrice Covasi, Carolina Rossini, and Natalia Fodic here with us today. Um, it took a little bit, but we got all you guys, and I know you guys have busy schedules, so uh, I'm particularly thankful that we were able to do this. Uh, uh, so why are we here today? Um, well, on April 23rd and 24th, the Net Mundial Conference on Global Internet Governance was hosted in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The conference brought together international stakeholders to develop principles of internet governance and propose a roadmap for the future. At the conference, uh, Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff signed Brazil's new internet law, the Marco Civil. This is really the, the highlight, uh, of, an, in my view, of what took place at this conference. Among the provisions of the Marco Civil are protections for freedom of expression, as well as for net neutrality. Uh, in my opinion, this is probably one of the most comprehensive attempts at dealing with internet regulation which is an issue that, like it or not, uh, most countries are going to have to address in the short term. So in this case, Brazil is, is really setting sort of the bar here on this issue uh, going forward. Uh, it still remains to be seen what complementary laws might be implemented to uh, this, uh, to the Marco Civil uh, and uh, to this new internet framework. But the Marco Civil itself has been well received as a positive example of how uh, government with active public participation can play a role on internet governance. I would also highlight uh, that the issue uh, matters right here in the United States. Uh, the recently proposed FCC regulations have brought net neutrality to the forefront, uh, and we are seeing some of these conversations that took place in, in Brazil uh, prior to the Marco Civil developing here in the United States as well. Uh, I would highlight that on May 15th, the FCC will be holding a public hearing to hear feedback on its proposed internet fast lane. Uh, this has been an ongoing debate here in the U.S. with previous regulations being overturned in the courts. Uh, needless to say, uh, these times are formative uh, regarding uh, what the internet will look like in the future. Um, our guests today will help us understand the implications of the Marco Civil, and I'd probably be able to answer these larger issues. Uh, as it relates to, uh, you know, internet governance in the global context. So I'm excited about that. As the internet connects the world in unprecedented ways, what can users and businesses with internet-based businesses uh, models expect of Brazil's internet reform? And is it a model for other nations to follow, the Brazil case? So I think these are, these are some of the questions that we're going to see uh, our panelists addressing today. I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, uh, first, we're going to start with Natalia Fodic, who is a consultant specializing in public policy and regulation. She has worked at the Brookings Institution here in D.C. and at Brazil's Ministry of Culture uh, and CADE, Brazil's antitrust agency. You guys have uh, extended versions of everybody's uh, bios, um, but I'll say that she's going to be setting the stage for the discussion today, answering what the Brazilian internet law is and providing important insight. Uh, we have Beatriz Covasi, uh, who is the digital, uh, who's the digital agenda and ICT counselor at the EU delegation here in D.C. Uh, as well, you, you should look at, at her bio and the extended uh, sheets that we have. And Carolina uh, Rossini, uh, who is the project director for the Latin American Resource Center at the Internet Governance and Human Rights Program at the New America Foundation's Open Technology Institute. That's a long title. Uh, but it says she's very busy and she's very smart. So um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, focus a, a little bit here on the logistics of what we're going to do. Uh, all of these folks here are the most qualified folks to talk about the topic. Uh, 
you know, if we're having a topic about Brazil, the Internet, Marco Civil, net neutrality issues as it relates to the topics uh, that I've referenced, these are the people that you'd want. Um, each of the panelists are going to give uh, opening remarks, uh, and then we'll move into a Q&A. Uh, we're on the record, and we're webcasting this event as well, so uh, greetings to everybody who's watching. Uh, we're going to be recording this, and we're going to be offering you a link so you can show them to your friends and see, they can see as well how smart you are. Um, uh, so without further ado, um, I want to thank everybody for being here today, and we move on to Natalia. Great. Thank you so much, Carl. I would like also to thank Carlos and Jillian for the invitation. Um, first, I would like to do a disclaimer. Although I work for the Inter-American Development Bank, I'm not here um, representing them today. So whatever opinions I give are my own opinions. Um, I guess that everyone can see the importance of this debate, and it's very interesting to see how in one year the issue has developed so much. I remember um, a little over one year ago, I was talking to Beatrice um, in Bolivia, and we were saying, well, this is, the internet is more than an instrument, it's more than a means to something, it's actually a new society, it's actually basically an end in itself in many cases. So I guess that all the, the, the current debate is showing its importance even more than one year ago when we were talking about this. Um, today, uh, we were gonna talk about Net Mundial and also uh, Marco Civil in Brazil. Um, let's start with Snowden revelations last year. This helped uh, the governance issue to, to come back to the agenda and also uh, somehow uh, the Marco Civil, which is a bill that has been um, debated in the Brazilian Congress for several years, actually, I guess, seven years. Uh, this also helped to accelerate and, and the process. Um, after we had the Snowden revelations, uh, President Rousseff came to the United Nations and she made a strong argument um, talking about freedom of expression, open multilateral and democratic governance, universality and cultural diversity and, and net neutrality. So I guess she set the stage for the debate, and after that, um, we received in Brazil the visit of Mr. Fadi Shehari. They agreed to do a meeting, uh, and this this is how Net Mondial started. Um, well, at that time also we had the Montevideo statement, which also supported you know the whole debate. The, uh, the statement was calling for the acceleration of the globalization of ICANN and IANA sanctions toward the environment in which all stakeholders, including all governments, participate on an equal footing. Um, well, and then more recently, in the end of last year, Germany and Brazil have passed a new resolution related to privacy. So I guess this is like the a general background and and let's talk about the Marcos view. What is Marcos view? Marcos view, as I said, has been uh, a bill that has been debated for over seven years and it has passed the House of Representatives and the Senate and um, President Rousseff, she, she has um, sanctioned during the event. One major issue that was causing a lot of contro controversy was not included in the final text of the bill, which is now a law, which relates to um, the data centers. So it's not included and, and this, this, the need 
for, for the companies to have data centers in the country has not been included in the final document. There is a really interesting uh, provision on da data retention, and that's something that I'm sure uh, Carolina and Beatrice will be able to talk further because there is a, a major difference between the, the European approach and the Brazilian approach. And actually, uh, the debate has been similar, as far as I understand, some years ago in Europe. So basically, uh, the companies are now, it's mandatory to retain data, data from, from the users for uh, a couple of months. And also, one, another major issue relates to net neutrality. And I know this is something that is really a heated debate now in the U.S. again. Um, it has been included in, in No Marcus View, but there are a lot of issues to be regulated in the near future, such as uh, the definition of discrimination, what emergency services are, um, sponsor plans for mobile market, so, for example, we uh, um, 800 broadband on your phone. Can you have apps that are free on your phone? Does that, uh, is this interfering with neutrality rules or not? You know, there are a lot of issues and that certainly the debate over net neutrality is gonna be there for a long time. At least, I mean, until it's not, finally regulated. Um, as next bills in Brazil after this, we will have a data protection bill, and that's something that's gonna come up soon, and also the reform of the copyright law, although it might, um, this might probably be debated next year only. So net mundial. So the two, Issues, they're not the same, but they're interrelated, especially because some of the principles that have been inserted in Marcus View are something that could serve as a reference to other countries' policies, too. Um, overall, related to um, the results of the event, I believe there is an overall consensus, at least among the governments, that it was a legitimate document. Uh, Russia, Cuba, and India have uh, expressed some, some discontentment on the legitimacy of the content and the process itself. But other than that, I guess there is an overall perception that it, it was a really important debate that is uh, that is setting the bar for for next debates in IGF and, and other fora. Uh, how many minutes? Okay. Um, Net Mondial had two main objectives to set a um, set of principles for internet governance and also a roadmap for future developments. Uh, regards to the principles, he has been drawing from previous uh, work in other forests, especially the Tunis agenda. And the main um, changes, let's say, can relate to some words that are really similar but ha might have different interpretations. So, um, multilateral and multi-stakeholder. So generally, when we talk about multilateral, is we, you relate more to uh, governments, whereas multi-stakeholder is a broader approach in which you have the civil society and, and uh, private sector and government. government. And also, the, the um, final version affirms that the role of and responsibilities of stakeholders should be interpreted in a flexible manner. So 
this, you know, with the rest of the document, you might, you relate to a more equal footing among all the stakeholders. And related to the roadmap, it's really interesting that, you know, the conference talked a lot about strengthening the role of GIGF, which is a forum that has been there for many years, and it's really important since it gathers, you know, the m m main experts in the field. And another issue that was addressed, but also had a, um, so right before the conference, ICANN has declared its intention to promote the transition of the so-called IANA functions, which have been, you know, they have been through a contract with the, the Department of Commerce. They have been responsible for it for many years, but the idea was, all has been always to transition that to, to uh, a different scenario in which a more neutral private sector consortium will be responsible for. So right before the meeting, they have announced that they are already taking measures to promote this transition. So this has helped the whole debate in Net Mondial. And well, I, I believe that that's, you know, a general framework of what has been happening. And overall, um, I believe it's a um, strong, there is a strong symbolism attached to the debate of the importance of having more people engaged, having countries, having private sector, having the civil society. And it also shows that the internet is a global resource and that is everyone's right to be engaged and to, to be considered, everyone's rights should be considered. And well, and also I believe it's really important to, to strengthen the role of people that have been involved on this throughout the past years because they know a lot of, well, you know, who the main players are. Well, and well, Vince Cerf, he w when he was reading his initial speech, he said, now I will finish because I don't have my last page here. I, I forgot to print it. That's not my case, but I know my colleagues here have a lot to talk about, and, and I will pass the... Great. <laughs> that seems to be good. No, w if I were Vince Cerf, I could do that for sure. Yeah. Since I'm not, I have printed my whole, every topic that I wanted to address, and I'm, I'm going to pass the microphone to Beatrice. Okay, so I heard for the first time, actually, he was nervous to present, so that was a first. That's a really good sign, I believe. It means that it's, it, the meeting was important, I guess. Okay, Patrick. Well, thanks. I have a lot of paper because uh, my smartphone died, but I'm sure that Vince should, could have you know, read it on his smartphone uh, <laughs> to be coherent with the internet age, and we should all maybe come with tab tablets next time. <laughs> but, um, well, thank you so much to CSIS, to Natalia, and uh, uh, the organizers of this initiative. It is the third time in one and a half days that I speak about internet governance. Uh, so those who have attended some of the other events, please forgive me if you will hear all over again from me some of the same themes. But this is a very good thing because it tells you how much uh, the uh, recent uh, announcement about the transition of IANA uh, functions uh, and also the Net Mundial event has sparkled a debate uh, on, uh, um, on internet governance. And um, this morning I was actually doing a off-the-record briefing with Bloomberg uh, and Hamadoun Touré was there and Chris Painter was there. So I cannot, because it was off the record and this is on the record, it would not be correct that I would repeat now exactly what was said. But I would like to emphasize that uh, what was striking to me is really that we are in a different era of uh, um, of the talks about internet governance. I mean, uh, when the commission in February, as some of you may remember, has issued this communication on internet governance, uh, which set out for the first time uh, uh, our strategy in this field, um, a European level. 
And uh, at that point in time, uh, we were looking at you know, two things with great interest. One was the call to globalization of IANA functions, which had not happened yet, and we kept repeating every single meeting with our American counterparts, you have to give a strong signal, you have to give a strong signal ahead of Net Mundial. And the second one was Net Mundial, because we thought that it was a one of a kind event, but an event which was quite iconic and had the power to shape the debate further on. And at this point in time, the atmosphere surrounding the debate, these two things have happened, so, the uh, Department of Commerce and, um, as uh, NTIA has announced the transition of IANA functions, Net Mundial has happened. So I think overall, from a European perspective, I can say that we are you know, positive and encouraged by these developments. And the tone of many conversation has been softened up and eased up uh, a bit in, this, uh, uh, in the light of these developments. So this is the you know, first uh, uh, big picture um, statement that I wanted to make. Uh, on uh, Net Mundial in particular, unfortunately I was not there, I was here in, uh, uh, in uh, DC, but uh, we were pleased also to see that there was a final communique, a final document. You will remember that many were skeptical here before the event, uh, and not only here, in general saying that a two-day conference uh, could not achieve consensus. So the fact that in itself there was a final document uh, with a large consensus, which uh, um, doesn't mean unanimity, but it was, it was a non-binding document, so it, it proved a large consensus. We think that in itself it was a great uh, uh, achievement. Uh, uh, if the conference was not able to come up with uh, even half a pager, then possibly you know, it would have been uh, uh, a bit of a uh, low uh, in, uh, in, the, in the debates, but it was good. And in the text itself, there are a number of issues that we like uh, as European Commission. We like that there is uh, some better determination uh, in terms of uh, timelines. So uh, there are some indications about uh, ICANN, IAN, and IGF, as Natalia mentioned, which uh, look at the timeline ahead. We like that we, there is the reference to uh, the idea of developing principles for transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness, and this applies both uh, uh, to organizations uh, and stakeholders. Um, there is the call, and this was also something we have repeatedly uh, uh, stressed, uh, the call to have uh, a better interaction between the technical community and uh, uh, the public authorities. Uh, and there is also reference to one point where we have uh, inserted uh, in our communication, which is the need to explore jurisdiction issues, which is of course one of the complicated points in this field and which needs to be addressed um, much more uh, in the future. So all in all on Net Mundial, uh, we have a very, um, positive uh, uh, take. Uh, Natalia, of course, is, has mentioned also many um, elements in the Marco Civil which uh, are present in different proposals. Uh, we don't have a Marco Civil, we don't have a framework law for internet in Europe. Um, but then switching to what are the proposals in the pipeline at the moment, I think that the European way to go uh, uh, is uh, a combination at the moment of three major proposals, but you're more or less familiar with. One is the data protection uh, revision and the regulation. The second one uh, is the cybersecurity, uh, it's called the Net Network uh, um, uh, Information Security Directive, NIS. And uh, the third one is the telecom single market. And I will not enter now in details of these proposals, but I would like to stress that uh, this is a package, you can see it as a package uh, which shows uh, our approach uh, um, and our way of balancing different needs at the moment. The need for security, the need for privacy, um, the need for a thriving internal market in uh, uh, telecommunications. As you know, we have a net neutrality provision, so this is something which uh, in the European uh, 
uh, take uh, exist. Uh, and of course, we are looking with very much interest at what the FCC and Tom Wheeler will do on the 15th of, uh, uh, of May. Um, I would say that uh, at some point, Natalia, you mentioned, you know, that we will have an end point. I don't think we will have an end point necessarily in these discussions or, you know, we will have final settlement. Um, probably we'll always have different approaches in the sense of the Brazilian law, uh, the European approach, the US approach. So we'll have complementary approaches. But what is striking to me is that all governments have started asking the same or very similar questions. That's the point. And have started approaching, though in slightly different ways, but the same big question of how to balance different aspects of public policy, and notably privacy versus security is one of the, uh, of the big uh, um, dilemmas that we are all confronted with. So it's interesting to see that uh, in this debate, uh, in reality, the debate around the internet, or you could put it the other way around, the debate about other things have become debate about the internet as well as our societies become more and more uh, linked to the use of uh, uh, the internet. So I will uh, stop here. I don't think it's in my, uh, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate to, for me to comment on Marco Civil, so I'll uh, pass on the floor to uh, Carolina. Great, Carolina. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, thank you again for the invitation and thank you everybody to be here in such a beautiful day in DC. Um, Thank you for speaking together. Um, but I wanna start, I wanna try to be a little provocative here with some of my affirmations and I would love them to discuss that with you later. So who here knows how many internet governance meetings are happening in 2014? How many internet governance meetings are happening this year, 2014? <laughs> it's not in there, but I can point to where it is. But we have from the government traditional multilateral meetings, 73 meetings this year. Net Mundial was one of those and actually was not counted when that counting was done. I have a document mapping all those meetings if you guys want to be interested and also how they interrelate. It's really interesting to see how documents coming out of one meeting can impact or not in some other track. So that's really important to understand. And, and also from advocate po point of view, uh, it, it's actually relevant for me to mention that I'm leaving NAF and moving to a direct role at public knowledge to lead the international part. So I'm speaking from advocate side, right? It's really important for us to understand this and how they relate because then that will uh, mold our strategy on how we, we say governments you say you said a in a certain path and you are saying b in other on other path and not just for advocates but also for companies and other stakeholders right so i think uh, the importance of net mundial here is actually was the tension it created when it was announced it clearly marked brazil emerging as a leader in the internet governance geopolitics and i think that's why it raised so much suspicions and so much tension from everybody around the world, including the US government, right? You had the State Department, uh, US was actually one of the biggest delegations to Net Mundial. So you see the weight the US and other countries have put in Net Mundial, and also seeing Brazil emerging as a leader when Dilma came to UN, how, uh, like when Natalia mentioned, saying, now I am pay, paying attention to that. And to them, it was not a matter of a, a, at our presidency level. And that's why Marco Civil was not approved like for years. Like I joke that actually we are fighting for a Marco Civil since 99, when I was still a lawyer at Telefonica and we had to kill a e-commerce bill, which was terrible for the internet in Brazil at that time, right? So that's a long fight in Brazil and different from Europe. It does not come from a market necessity, but actually has a reaction to a series of threats that would criminalize a lot of actions, users uh, uh, developing the day by day uh, in the internet, which actually very similar to our analog life, but they had a little more impact on our online life. Um, uh, one thing uh, I could also share with you, I have translated the Marco Civil into English and reviewed that a, a couple of times to ensure it's as uh, 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 trustworthy as possible, so I'm happy to share that with you. 
uh, and I'm happy to go over some of the uh, of the uh, provisions of Marco Civil with you. But uh, uh, but I do think it's important to express, and uh, Beatriz mentioned that uh, there was a lot of energy. I'm almost my voice is actually changing because uh, I actually don't have even even the voice I had because there was so much uh, so much energy and so much work done during that week. You had a regional consultation for Frank LaRue. You had another UNESCO consultation on internet index development. You had math neutrality. You had tons of academia meetings in Brazil. So everybody really saw that as an extremely important symbolic moment to push things forward. And if you guys say, I don't like the outcome document, which a lot of folks have said, has specifically Russia, India, I think, and Cuba, who actually have not engaged much in the process, and also some civil society organizations that wanted to see uh, some items throw through the document, uh, which uh, in my personal opinion is, 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 is not how most stakeholderism uh, works or it's not like a, a um, how do you say that, uh, something reasonable to expect of such a uh, process. If you want to say, I want to throw that document away, Net, Net Mundial did serve off some things and we approved Mark Civil. So now the world has a success case to say that's possible, such framework is possible, and we have a major country in the world that's setting broadband uh, and submarine cables to Africa, to Europe, uh, to the Caribbean. We are be Brazil is a, a, a powerful uh, uh, infrastructure development internet. We wanna do that, not just because we are nice to our neighbors in many cases, but because we do feel the obligation to do that to also improve the experience in our country. Uh, uh, so I think that's what we need to look for. And I actually thank to the world all the tension and excitement you guys had in Brazil because then that helped us to pass the democracy view <laughs> that for so many years we fought for um, um, and, 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 and did uh, gave us many uh, uh, days of happiness and sadness and, 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 and caipirinhas and wines as we were <laughs> discussing <laughs> recently. And I'm sorry, I had to drink, folks. That <laughs> has been like a year long, uh, many years long of, of, of discussions and debates. And actually training the legislative and also the judiciary to deal with that because Marco Civil is an incredible law in paper, but we have so much to do in Brazil, right? Uh, 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 and, but I think we don't, we cannot separate the importance of that, right? Brazil is still is really bad in terms of uh, take down notices you guys see for example, in all the transparency reports of companies like Google, Twitter, and uh, now Microsoft has one too, we are putting tons of content down, both uh, because of honor and personality rights, but also because of copyright. Uh, we, we still have a lot of censorship issues. Journalists still get killed in Brazil, so their reality is not so beautiful. But again, the Marco Civil is an incredible, powerful document to actually change the narrative and hopefully change the practice in Brazil. So if we want to say Net Mundial was a success because of that, it was a success because of that. We would not have Marco Civil as a model for the world, a good benchmark for the world, if that was not the case. Both uh, the IANA uh, announcement, um, I will not comment on that. I provide the testimony in the house. I'm happy to share that with you from a, a public interest perspective. So both the IANA, which was a confidence vote, right, was a trust vote to restore trust internationally, and the Marco Civil was another trust vote on internet governance and, uh, 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 and human rights online. And I think uh, that brings a lot of positive uh, uh, expectation in a year that we're gonna have the uh, IQ uh, plenipotentiary in November, right, which again, there are a lot of risks of as the media say in the US, non-democratic governments taking over the internet. So now you have both the Net Mundial document and Marco Civil and the UN resolution on privacy and a series of documents coming from these 73 meetings to go back to the ITU and say that's not the, the forum we want uh, uh, to move forward with some uh, regulation around the top layers, content applications and social layers of the internet. So again, I, I agree with my colleagues that was an iconic moment, was a, a, a moment that everybody was so tense, and I think that helped to everybody be as sincere as they could be in that environment, and also express very clearly what they wanted. We saw a rupture within the business sector, 
I had identified at least three sectors within the business sectors. You had the copyright leading industries, you had the telcos, and you had the application service providers, and they have very different positions. So even to say that business has consensus is not true, and for us to understand that and map that and see who is who, it's very important moving forward in, in this uh, next meetings in here. Um, I'm happy to talk about Marcos Review, but maybe we can open for questions and uh, I'm happy to later clarify how is data retention. We don't have more uh, requests for uh, local servers. We just have clear <coughs> jurisdiction rules. They were clear already based on international private law, but the companies were refusing to collaborate with the court, so the legislative felt the need to put clear jurisdiction rules in the Marcos Review. Net neutrality is there, is enforced has two very restricted uh, exceptions, such as emergency rules and, and, and some other prioritizations. They, our president will regulate that, that's normal. Uh, our president regulates laws in Brazil through decrees, and that's normal, that's our tradition. But thankfully, the good news is that she's gonna be advised both by Anatel and our Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, and that's good. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop here uh, 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 and, and then open for questions uh, to be sure that I'm answering specific questions and interests regarding the Marcos view. Great. Well, all of you, thank you for your super comprehensive uh, presentations. Uh, I'm going to have a couple questions, and before I open it up to uh, to folks uh, sitting in the audience, uh, could you talk a little bit about what makes the Marcos view unique? Um, we've talked about how special it is, and, and you focused in particular, Carolina, on you know what the feeling was uh, at, at, at Net Mundial and having to do with this, but what makes it so unique? I mean, wh why is it such a unique document? Uh, are other countries doing something similar to that? Uh, is there something you can compare it with? Uh, I make reference to what's happening here, and you know, you're getting a lot of folks interested, concerned, showing their views on, on this uh, with the net neutrality discussion that, that we're having here in the U.S. But, but could you talk a little bit about that? What makes it so different? Are there any other similar documents uh, in other countries? And uh, all of you can participate or answer sure. that. Yeah. I was asking to talk a little closer to the microphone. So for the first time, I think, in the world based, and I can comment a little bit on other legislations coming from other countries, we do have a comprehensive uh, law that deals with every issue you can think regarding internet. Uh, uh, if you think about in the internet in layers, like infrastructure, application, content, and social. So it does deal with all of them, uh, and while it does not go into details on the content layer regarding take it down, because we're gonna take care of that in our copyright law reform, which is also happening since 2003, um, uh, uh, it does deal with the rest, and it was a response with a, 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 a to really enforce uh, human rights in Brazil and that also recognized has, uh, UN has recognized through its special reporters that what applies offline applies online. And it was actually a pretty big challenge because folks, when we, I was in, uh, I was teaching in a law school in Brazil, which actually hosted and developed the first draft of the bill uh, and then went to public consultations. And it was a huge, uh, 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 taken because we wanted to deal with every possible uh, uh, civil issue that could come out of the practice of the internet, but also in a has open-ended as possible to recognize the evolution of technologies, right? So that's why it's important here to not put tons of restrictions on net neutrality on, on, on how log rotation is dealt with because we don't know how this is gonna evolve, right? And we are seeing this here, uh, regarding net neutrality, right? Willer is saying about non-commercialization issues, and, and maybe that's another issue that's gonna come up in Brazil. But one thing that's important is to understand that Brazil is still a developing country, and because of that, uh, thinking about the net neutrality rule, it's even more important, right, to allow a social entrepreneurship that's happening in Brazil nowadays that didn't exist when I left Brazil seven years ago, right? It's a, a, a really interesting uh, uh, to see how that's happening right now there in terms of uh, new business models and business models coming 
even from a grassroots experience, right? So I think it's really important to see and, and, and to consider, it, for example, what would be the impact of deals like Netflix are doing here mm -hmm. in Brazil at this moment where people are actually just now learning how to innovate and, and do business in the internet. So I think it's, it's really important to place this legislation within a cultural and regional architecture that's pretty different from developed countries, right? And uh, another thing that we see too is uh, a, a clear recognition of both privacy and freedom of expression online, which was never our tradition in Brazil, right? If you go and s review jurisprudence in Brazil, like court decisions in Brazil regarding these issues, in general, the right to honor and personality rights won many more, uh, like much more than freedom of expression, right? Freedom of expression is a very American uh, concept that uh, uh, it, it was not incorporated in Brazil until recently. And of course, again, we're gonna have a huge work at even training uh, uh, the judges and even changing some curricula in law schools to incorporate that, right? Even intellectual property was not taught as obligatory courses 10 years ago in Brazil. So th it, you, this law comes within a, a, a need to answer to some very specific uh, 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 regional context and needs, but also, in addition, and you guys may have heard, to two cyber crime laws that uh, came into the Congress around 2005, 2006, criminalizing a series of activities, uh, which they are understandable, but as you, you may know, is one of the origins of uh, a lot of uh, malware and a lot of uh, fraud in, ba in online banking. Uh, people in Brazil are incredibly creati creative. We do have amazing software developers. So we did have a lot of trouble in that area. So there were a legislative response to criminalize a series of activities, right? Entering again in the cybersecurity uh, framework. So the response to that was, we are not ready yet to deal with that. We need to understand better technology. So let's first protect the good users uses and the user's rights and freedoms uh, uh, and, and human rights online, and then we're gonna understand what is the cybersecurity, uh, what are the cybersecurity threats we need to deal with. So I think it, Marcos Review comes within that context. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you wanna say something? Well, I agree with Carolina that, well, it's a changing mindset in which you not only need responsibilities but also mainly you need rights. So this change of mindset and not only have criminal laws related to the internet, but civil rights, because it's a new society. Oh, and actually I, I wasn't able to convey my point, I guess you might, I, I don't mean that we are coming to an end in the debate. I mean that the internet itself is a new society. That's what I meant. Well, and coming back to Marco Civil, I also like, uh, the issue that Carolina raised on the regional perspective, because in order to understand what she uh, raised, you, you need to understand that a little bit about the infrastructure and the um, uh, the railroads of the the internet. So most of the traffic actually comes to the U.S. and that's also when most of the data is hosted. So whenever you need a uh, court needs an uh, a information or, or also that increases cost. The fact that the data comes, you know, so far away, that also increases costs for the end users. So it's also uh, important to have local the development of the infrastructure locally and to invest in access. Actually, access also has been uh, something that was raised in Net Mondial, as some is there too. Uh, it's important to have this um, not only national but re regional awareness of the infrastructure and, and, and investing on that. I think I'm gonna open it up to some questions because um, the answers have been very complete. Uh, questions, questions at the back here, and then we'll come up. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Pat Gorowski from the Boys and Noise Foundation. I have here uh, one question 
to Carolina Rossini because I saw that uh, you worked on intellectual property rights and on this. So I wonder what were the tensions in the meetings between the network, the internet, and intellectual property rights. And the other question I had is to all three of you. Uh, in banking regulation, they messed it up completely because only experts in banking regulation were working and it ended up in a very degenerated process. How, how have you guaranteed real diversity within these discussions? Is the, is the normal little small uh, user represented in any way? Let me get a couple questions and we'll answer them. Gentleman up here, can you just wait for the microphone? He's coming. Hi, I, I'm Mike Godwin with Internews, and my question has to do with uh, a, a, a somewhat analogous uh, development in the Philippines uh, just last uh, co couple of years with uh, the Philippines crowdsourced uh, Magna Carta for Philippines Internet Freedom. Uh, what I'm wondering about uh, in the context of international internet governance is what uh, people's feelings are about exporting uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the Marco Seville uh, to, to other countries because I think there, there is a hunger uh, among civil society actors to uh, change the dialogue from uh, worries about cyber crime or computers and digital technologies as threats and a desire to see all of uh, cybercrime laws and, and uh, internet-related laws placed in a framework of positive affirmations and guarantees of human rights, which includes, which could include freedom of expression and privacy and so on. So I'm wondering about uh, what the hopes are for generalizing from, I think, the great, what we've seen in the great success and the passage of the Marco Seville in Brazil and of uh, the Net Mundial uh, consensus uh, statements. Mm -hmm. Why don't we start off with those? You want to start? So, on intellectual property and internet governance, um, I personally see those things related. Um, as I see uh, uh, internet governance, I am one, I am part of that group of people that see internet has a set of layers that interact. So, for me, it's hard to disconnect both. Uh, and I've, I worked at WIPO already. I worked with trade agreements. I've been doing all this work. And everywhere you go, companies are there. And they need to be there. That's their role, right? That doesn't mean we agree, but that's their role. And they were at Net Mundial. And they were in, 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 in heavy weight on, for example, the US briefing, just Net Mundial. And in that briefing, they said clearly, and they, they, their strategy to introduce uh, the copyright issues in the Net Mundial. So that was expected. I think people that were not expecting was, were not actually paying attention. And as soon as the document opened for the online contributions in that participative pa uh, platform that Brazil put it up, uh, you could see like hundreds of comments trying to insert uh, balance between uh, the human right of freedom of expression, access to information, access to knowledge in regard to copyright. That, that, that battle you keep going for years and uh, 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 you're gonna always have uh, uh, fair use and, and exceptions and limitations in tension with uh, the content-driven company. So that, what happened there was a microcosmo of what happens everywhere <laughs> in this battle. So we just need to be prepared and understand and, and, and see where we can uh, compromise or not and see how we're gonna regulate that. So for example, in Take It Down, we're gonna push, uh, and that w happened in Marco Civil. So in Take It Down Notice, for example, we wanted clear, a clear statement in Marco Civil that any Take Down should be preceded by a court order, right? And that didn't happen because there were so many pressures. The telcos were pressuring uh, the, rep the Malone, which was the house representative writing the bill on a neutrality global our biggest media company was pressuring on take down and content. Uh, uh, more paternalist uh, uh, politicians were pressured around take down uh, regarding nudity of <coughs> teenagers and things like, like that. So at least one thing they said, okay, let's give a step back and leave that for the copyright law, right? You can interpret, in, you, you can build a narrative that judicial order still needed do on how the text of the, the law is construed, but still it's gonna be 
postpone, right? So I think it's, it was just a, a, a tension that happens everywhere. And I'm glad that, for example, at WIPO now, uh, we have approved, like uh, in the public interest, the Marrakesh Treaty for the blind. Now we are discussing exceptions and limitations for librarians, and hopefully that's gonna expand for museums. Uh, hopefully the broadcasting treaty, which can limit even cases like the Arrow case here in the US, will not move forward the way it is, limiting, limiting uh, uh, distribution of content over the internet. And we're gonna, after that, have exceptional limitations treaty or, or being discussed, right, not uh, on education. So that fight still is being played. And 73 meetings is just internet governance. If you add the IP ones, it's more 100, right? And again, hmm. and you have trade agreements which actually are binding documents compared to, if you compare to all the documents coming from the IG world. And it surprises me that a lot of people in the IG world does not pay attention to trade, trade agreements. Downstairs they are discussing the transatlantic one and those are binding norms. And you have ISP liability there, you have safe server placement there, you have tons of IG issues <coughs> being being negotiated both in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and the Transatlantic Partnership Agreement, right? So uh, um, I think we have to have this holistic view to see where the battles and where the binding documents are coming from so we, we pay attention. Anyway, so diversity. Um, Why don't we give some Yeah, let's get yeah. and then we go. Yeah. <laughs> because I know all of you can answer all of the questions. <laughs> but uh, Natalia and Beatrice. Um, well, quickly also to your previous one, I mean, it's, uh, we have started examining, of course, similarities uh, and, uh, and differences between our internal market, uh, telecom single market proposal and Marco Civil. Uh, of course, the issue for us, and I didn't mention it before, but I'm, I'm sure that you're all aware, is that um, the telecom single market proposal is now making its way through legislation, right? So, so we don't have, we have a commission initial proposal, then the European Parliament voted in April, uh, so we have a text of the European Parliament, but we have not yet a final text of uh, uh, legislation where we could make really one-to-one -one, uh, um, comparison. But in a nutshell, I think that especially on net neutrality, there are many provisions which are similar, you know, not identical, I mean, we don't have uh, some things that Marco Civil has, uh, um, like not creating harm uh, to, to users or other provisions, uh, uh, but we have similar provisions. The approach, however, as I said, is different. We don't have a framework uh, legislation covering all aspects uh, related to the internet and telecom. We still consider the telecom market as uh, uh, more uh, traditionally uh, telecom. Um, and, uh, and then we have uh, cyber, as I mentioned, and privacy in different pieces of, uh, of legislation. Uh, I love the question about uh, in how to, to have more voices included, because uh, I could give you an answer which is the classical you know, policymaker, rule-making answer, saying that we have stakeholders consultation, and we talk to the industry, and we talk to the citizens. But what is, um, and this is my personal view here, is not, it's not, I'm not speaking, you know, I'm speaking on personal, uh, grounds, uh, but what I think is really interesting nowadays and what has happened with the internet evolution uh, is that there is an unprecedented uh, request for transparency. Mm. You see it, you mentioned the TTIP negotiations. I mean, we saw it also in our trade agreements uh, in the past. People want to be part of it, they want a transparency which is not just tell us what you're negotiating, uh, it's transparency more like open up your doors, uh, show us the negotiating sessions, uh, show us the text. Um, which of course is very interesting development, I think, and it, it tells how much this participatory model is uh, uh, evolving uh, at the moment. So. Yeah. Uh, can I just follow up on, on one thing? Is the Marco Civil gonna have any impact on business in Brazil? Or for folks interested in being involved in this sector, it will it have a positive impact or negative? I mean, how do you, how do you view that? Natalia or Carolina? Uh, sh we should address the, the questions before they I, are Either continue. one, but I mean. Uh, well, <laughs> to your question, I believe that there are a lot of things that were already in place. So it's not that we didn't have any rules related to net neutrality before, for example. We did have. Um, and Atel had uh, rules about it. 
but um, by the now it's gonna be again uh, regulated, and then you know it might it might interfere with business models. But I don't see in the short run. I don't see any differences. Mm -hmm. I see maybe Carolina has a different point of view, but I, I believe that you know the main rules of net neutrality were already in place. And that, you know, we will see how, again, there are some issues pending, you know, what, what are the exceptions in the rule, how, how is this going to be regulated, but in the short run, I don't see major changes. Uh, I, I'm going to comment on other aspects and, and then I can come back to that, but I do think that actually it does has impact for good and for the bad. Uh, for the good, because finally a lot of business that invest in Brazil and want to do business in Brazil, they have more clear rules on how they have to treat data, how they have to treat content, and that was not clear. If you see uh, judicial uh, decisions from the north and from the south, and then from the southeast, they are completely different. Article 19 did a study of uh, almost 200 uh, decisions with, uh, was a partnership between Article 19 and uh, our Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, and hopefully that's going to be soon published. And it was like all over the place. So that does generate a lot of legal risk, which of course mirrors costs, increasing costs for companies on how they deal with it and how many lawyers they have to hire in Brazil. So there are a lot of things that were clarified with Marco Civil. So that's why it's for the good and the bad. I say, for example, telcos will have to uh, do log retention for six months. Uh, application providers like Google, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, sorry. Telcos for one year, application service provider for six months. Now I'm, I'm messing up the things, but I, I have here for you later if you want to see. But anyway, there is log retention for up to one year, uh, which is different from Europe, which is different from Colombia, which is five years. Um, so Mark Civil is better than Colombia, actually. But it's still, right? It's, so companies do have a series of costs they will have to deal with Brazil and also the difference on how legislation gets interpreted. And also there is a conflict of jurisdiction between US and Brazil because now Brazil is saying the jurisdiction is mine, so you're going to have to give me data even if the US law is telling you you cannot share this data. <laughs> uh, whenever there is a person or a business implicated in Brazil, the, the, the application service provider or the telco will have to provide the information to the court. So those are some things that, in my opinion, they generate more legal security, <coughs> but they also generate costs and complexity to manage business in Brazil. On, on net neutrality, uh, uh, the business did gain uh, also because they say uh, one of the principles of the law, which is part of Article 3, uh, is saying that there should be uh, freedom for business models in internet, but at the same time they do submit, they do constrict that principle to the other principles in law and net neutrality is another one. So there's going to be a balance there. So I don't know what's going to happen after that. We're going to have to wait for uh, Gilma, Natel and CG figure out the specifics of the rule. Any other questions? Sir? Why don't we, why don't we take these two last ones because we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. So we'll do it together. Sir? Hi, my name is Mike Haja Dudley, and I'm with Development Finance International. I had a specific question about the data centers. I know that they were tabled um, on in this bill, but is that still an issue of contention? Um, have people decided to table it for the long term? And what's your feeling regionally, um, or I guess internationally, on these type of provisions, which would significantly affect business? Um, within the countries. And the gentleman in the back here. There's a microphone. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Andrew Mack, AM Global. And uh, first of all, congratulations to Brazil. Because regardless of what happens over the long term, whether this is good for the world or not, it's absolutely a big victory for Brazil. Uh, the Marco Civil is something I know you guys wanted for a long time, and it's tremendous, tremendous feather in the cap of the, the government. Um, my, my question is really a very simple one, though. Uh, as uh, someone who's been to a bunch of IGF meetings and tw 25 some ICANN meetings, there is already structure there. And uh, Natalia, you mentioned one of the, I, I got, you have a quote I loved. It said, You want to put everyone on a more equal footing, which suggests to me right now that there's a disequal footing. And so my question is how would things be different in a post net mundial world? And if some people are less equal, who should get more and who should get less? And please, if you'd be so kind, don't be too diplomatic. Thanks. <laughs> All right. 
the, the provision of data centers was uh, taken out of the bill that passed into law on April 23, when I was crying. <laughs> uh, so the provision was taken out, but um, what was said, it is in Article 10 and, and Articles after 10. I can share with you the, the, the English version of it. It says that uh, telcos have to do log retention for one year and application for s service providers for six months and they have to obey court orders to share data and if one party or one service affect Brazil, so it's Brazilian jurisdiction. So that's it. Dilma understood that putting servers in Brazil don't work, right? That's not how internet works. She got that pretty fast. So the, cha the law was changed pretty fast and, and, and um, folks are pretty comfortable on, on this. Companies are not so comfortable because they're gonna have to deal with uh, giving data to the government, and but uh, uh, that's not there anymore. And um, I think that's the end of the questions, right? Uh, very quickly on localization, I think, you know, that's reality that some localization requirements always existed and possibly, you know, we continue to <laughs> exist if you think about financial services or uh, uh, other specific sectors. So I think what is uh, uh, key and quite crucial is to avoid to get to a situation where uh, it becomes really a closed system, right? So where there is a generalized localization requirement, uh, which is uh, um, makes, uh, creates then uh, uh, what somebody referred to as the splinter net. So an internet which is uh, being split, uh, and I prefer this term than the usual one of balkanization for obvious reasons. <laughs> But I think it's, uh, it's an important point, and uh, the fact that we, Marco Civil did not go in, uh, into that direction uh, uh, avoids the temptation maybe that many other uh, countries uh, uh, could have gone completely in, uh, in that direction and leaves you know, more openness uh, to other solutions. But in that direction, I was also curious to know more about how this debate on data retention had, had evolved, because I know that some years ago you had a different approach and this has recently changed. Well, it was a sentence of the Court of Justice which struck down our data retention uh, uh, rules. So I am not you know, uh, sure what will, uh, uh, will come next, uh, but again, it's a question of uh, um, of finding a good balance, you know, between having actually uh, a, a period of retention which is uh, meaningful for law enforcement purposes, uh, and it does not become uh, uh, too burdensome for uh, uh, for companies. On the other hand, uh, um, and in a different uh, realm, if you want, but I would like to underline that in our cybersecurity legislation, we had a provision. Uh, uh, which is very dear to the Commission, not everybody else thinks uh, the same, uh, which is extending you know, the uh, data breach notification requirements uh, also to the internet platforms. Mm. Uh, so not just to the telcos, not just to the telecom companies, but in our original proposal, we thought that also the digital platforms uh, um, were required to notify uh, uh, breach, uh, um, uh, yeah, to, to give uh, breach notification. So, uh, this is still being debated. We, we have not, you know, we have not come to, to a conclusion. But it's just to show you that you can always find uh, uh, different angles to this uh, uh, to this debate, and the balance to be struck as legislators is indeed a very uh, difficult one. And Natalia, you have the opportunity to close the, the gentleman's answer back there, and about uh, I guess how the Michael C. Bill or how this reform. Uh, can help equal the playing field. Uh, I, I, I think that, that that's what your question was, who could be the winners and who would be the, yeah. Well, and also there's his question related to uh, how to, to generalize the. Sure. I guess it's a really good question and, and there is, always things that are a matter of policy and countries will have to, to adapt the, the <coughs> principles and their policies to their situation and context. 
but uh, I believe that we see as countries try to discuss on how to, to get inspired, let's say, by Marco Civil and also Net Mondial, that we can actually have some common principles that are applied across different countries and regions. But your question is hard to reply because Try. Oh, um, <laughs> because of course there there was already a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, but I guess that it's interesting to see how the the debate has shifted last year from ITU and and let's take over the internet, which in my opinion is not how our government has framed that. We never said let's transfer to the ITU, we just said we need more diversity in the debate. And actually, for what I see, I see, it, I see more people now getting engaged in the debate, whereas before you already have civil society and private sector and everyone on IGS, but it's always not the same people, but I mean, I, I see much more people get involved on this now, and that I, I believe that all the, the recent developments are helping to get more students aware, you know, more, I, I, I even heard that there's many more PhD students interested in doing their thesis in the topic, and I guess raising the awareness of the, what the main issues are is gonna help having a better conversation. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank Natalia, Beatrice, and Carolina. Your, your answers have been super complete. Uh, I really appreciate that. You took the time to do that and out of your busy schedules to come up here. So will you please all join me in a round of applause.